Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, I will try to get to as many questions as I possibly can. But first, I want to say hi to you, Mom and Dad. Hello, and thank you. How are you? Good. Good. Yeah, Great we're we're, we're ha actually we're having a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> week, Heather, as you know, you know, because you're very much, very much involved, you're in charge. We're running an extremely successful 12-day program right now. It's amazing. I don't know how in the world we get so many nice people who have so many problems. They just kind of show up on our doorstep. And, you know, we're at what, day 10 of the of the program, and every one of them is doing amazing. What's that? Oh, and they're having fun, too. They're having fun, yeah. So anyway, it's been, a, it's been a really exciting week. I have to say that when we run a program, it's a, always a good week for me. And uh, it's always a busy week. It's it is, a yeah. really busy week for Heather. Yeah. Well, you and mom and, are a big yeah. part of it. Every morning you wake up and we have a, a 9 a.m. chat where we do just what we are doing here and answer questions yeah. and just get to know one another. And and then I moderate the whole 12 days. So I'm there. For, there all the time. But it's great. We've had a lot you of know, fun. I, I, I really like the, some of the comments from people about how much they enjoy the session without us. You know, the, we, we start every morning at seven o'clock with uh, Pacific time with a session that just involves the participants. And so they get to talk about how they're doing and, you know, what kind of problems they've had and successes and failures and how the McDougal staff is treating them. And, you know, but yeah, they, because no staff is there. No, they're, no staff. They're, they just meet. So they meet every morning. They, they like make, uh, new friends that they keep for a whole life. I think that's one of the problems is a lot of people, and maybe this five o'clock evening, Sunday evening session helps fulfill that is people feel like they're so alone, you know, trying to follow a diet that we teach and everybody seems to be doing something else. And they're very, you know, they're as strong as they are in their opinions about politics and religion as they are about food. So it gets there's some really hot hot discussions. And it's nice to be able to have. Uh, in fact, I, I would guess there must be there must be about four repeats. We have more than that repeats in the program, but I think four of them they they kind of indicate the reason that they're in this program again. Well, encouragement helps. They they want the encouragement. Is they just want to be around, you know, like minded people, and uh, so that's that's, you know, certainly the program uh, offers that opportunity all day long to be around like minded people. And a lot of people meet new friends that they keep forever. And yeah, we have sessions going on from three years ago that people are still getting together. They they made friends, they support each other, and and that, that's one of the problems, of course, is to get is to get people around you that eat a healthy diet. And uh, we're able to provide that in the program. Uh, you'll make friends. Do, do we also have a a big session, Heather, where the, all the people who've been through the McDougal program get together and talk like? Without us, do we do this? Do we do this? Every, every Wednesday. So once you graduate from the 12 day course, you're part of a, a weekly meetup. So everyone that's graduated from the course is invited, and that's every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific. So you literally, I, I think a lot of people do that too. Yeah. You literally get to be with the, you know, hundreds of other people who've been through the program. And again, it's unmonitored by Mary or I or Heather or any of our team. You know, we don't know what goes on. Uh, we have we you know we get some feedback. It was important, but um, yeah, these people have been doing this with us for, on the telemedicine program for for over three day, three years now, and uh, and they talk to each other about how they're doing, yeah. and they exchange recipes, and uh, I mean they they say they have so much fun just talking to each other. Well, I, I was thinking, and there are also some people that just make friends and groups of their particular program. So we've got, you know, hundreds of people who've been through the program that you can meet and you can hear their stories or their complaints or whatever. And then you've got a, a more personal group that you can develop. I don't know whether Heather helps you do that or not, <clears throat> but where you can just meet with some friends that you met during the program. Those are really, really interesting people in this program. So there they all, they're always are. I, you know, I, I've said it before, and I think it deserves saying again. On our adventure trips, where we used to take people around uh, the North and South Hemisphere, Hawaii, et cetera, you know, we always had the nicest people, the most interesting people. 
And uh, I, I got to the, the part where I, I figured that we either do collect really, really nice, interesting <laughs> people, or we bring out the best in people. I think it's a little bit of both because you're in a situation where everybody has the same goal, which is to have a better life. And in general, they're successful people because quite honestly, it's only successful people that follow this program because it takes a bit of work, a little bit of effort to do it. So, you know, I'll just relate to you and then we can get on with the questions. My graduation from my medical residency from the John Burns School of Medicine in Honolulu, Hawaii, my chief of medicine had a, a, a well, we had a, a, a love-hate relationship for the more than two years. I studied to be an internist. And we got into uh, arguments about whether food had anything to do with disease, et cetera. But I think he liked me. His name was Irv Schatz from, um, from Honolulu. He's died since I hear. But Irv, uh, he called me in the last day of my medical residence. And I already had my ticket. So I wasn't worried about him penalizing me for what I had to say or didn't say. And he, he said, he said, John, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about you with your crazy ideas about vegetarian diets. He says, all you're going to do is collect a bunch of bums and hippies. You're going to starve to death. And I thought for a minute and I said, you know, if that's the case, that's the way it'll be because I can't do these things to people that I know are wrong. I can't put them on drugs or send them off to surgeries that I know are wrong. Then I said something that really has turned out to be true. And this was like, probably half a century later that this, earlier that this conversation took place. As I said to Dr. Schatz, as I pointed toward his prospering abdomen, I said, you know, I said, uh, it's not gonna be bums and hippies that follow me. It's gonna be successful people who along the way they say to themselves, I'm such a big success. I got a great education, built a wonderful business. I've got a wonderful spouse, great children. I just succeed in everything I do, except for my health. Why am I overweight? Why am I diabetic? Why do I have cancer? Why am I heading toward the heart surgery? And then they say to themselves, it, it shouldn't be that way. And my answer to them is, it shouldn't be that way if you <laughs> have the right set of rules. That's the problem. You don't have the right set of rules. And that's why you're failing. So you folks, beginning this session, five o'clock, Pacific time, Sunday, sometime in July, 2023. <laughs> I want to tell you, I have no doubt this is a crowd of successful people. Doesn't mean you're all billionaires. It means you put some effort in life. So you really care and you don't want to fail in your health. After all, you know, you've heard the saying, if without your health, you have nothing. So that's the kind of clientele that we've collected over the last half a century and still do. And that's why I say these people are so interesting. This group is, you know, they, you know, teachers and a wedding planner that I'm going to see tomorrow. So good fun. Yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, let's get to some questions. I've got a bunch that have been written in. So John writes in and he says he's 63 years old, very strict, whole food plant-based for two years. Last month, he went to see his optometrist. And they said his IOP was high. And they said he's at risk for developing glaucoma. They mm -hmm. prescribed a bunch of drugs that made him sick. They said he could do laser surgery. What do you recommend? Can diet help? Yeah, diet helps with glaucoma with raised eye pressures. There's a couple of different kinds of glaucoma. One is called closed angle and the other is called open angle. And I think I've got the, 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 the correct one is the one that responds and is most common is the open angle glaucoma. And uh, there was a study done. It was a rather informal study. It was done at Weimar, which is a program similar to ours. They're east of Sacramento, California. They're based on the Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist religion, a great program. And Sally Malgram, who is still a practicing ophthalmologist in San Diego, California, she went to the program uh, and she measured the eye pressures in people when they started the program, when they ended the program. And she got enough data. She should have published it. It showed a dramatic reduction in eye pressure in this short, short time, you know, fewer than two weeks. So I would expect that. Of course, they could have the other kind of glaucoma which it's not related to, to diet, related maybe to infection or injury. 
But uh, you should expect the pressure to get better. Now, the way I'd go about doing it so you didn't risk anything is that sit down with your, your ophthalmologist, not an optometrist, an ophthalmologist, you know, an eye doctor, medical doctor. And I say, look, I'm going to change my diet, whether you like it or not. And uh, I'd like to not do anything foolish. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to come in every couple of months. And I'd like to measure our, my eye pressure. I'm not going to take the drugs right now, doc. But I'm going to be really strict on the McDougall diet because Dr. McDougall said that you can reduce eye pressure, just like you do reduce blood pressure, which we've published the results of by changing my diet. So I uh, will come in every every couple of months and you can do blow this little thing or they've got a new technique out. They don't blow the air in anymore. Oh, really? Yeah, I just oh. found that out last week when I went and had my refraction checked. Okay. Yeah, so uh, they got a whole new way of measuring eye oh. pressure. So anyway, you just check it out. And uh, if you're not doing well, then you should consider the drugs, which are generally eye drops. And... Uh, and, you know, you could always look at the evidence to see how effective the eye drops are in preventing blindness. I haven't done that in, so in a long time. So I wouldn't comment, but I certainly would, like all therapies, I think you ought to have the evidence that it's going to work and not based on somebody's hunch, some big guess from some important doctor who, of course, has a ton of degrees. And so you should respect his or her guess. <laughs> you should base it on scientific work. And the best scientific work available is, is done by randomized control trials. And uh, we have our, had our, our program tested at Oregon Health and Science University with a randomized control trial of a group of people who we studied over an entire year. You know, I had virtually no input into this particular study done at Oregon Health and Science University, <clears throat> except to teach them. You know, I insisted that we be the educators of these people because so often when the diet wars take place and they set up an experiment where they say match Atkins and Ornish or, you know, some other high, high carbohydrate versus uh, low carbohydrate diet test, <clears throat> they don't educate the people properly. Like in the study I'm thinking of with Ornish versus Atkins. They just handed him a book and said, do it. Well, you know, maybe you can do the low carb diet out of a book. After all, it's just a matter of going through the drive-in line at the fast food restaurant and ordering your food and throwing away the bun and scraping off the, the ketchup and the mustard and the pickles, throw them away too. And you're on the Atkins diet. What we teach requires a little bit more effort, except we try and make it as simple as possible for you. And, uh, you know, that's a complaint I got from uh, one of the participants that I'll be seeing tomorrow is that, you know, it, she just, she's busy. She says she works 16 hours a day in her wedding planning business. And she doesn't have done time, doesn't have the time to put into the cooking. And of course, we spend the whole 12 days trying to make it as simple as possible. Like you told this morning about the enchiladas you made. <laughs> Didn't take you long at all, but. No. Why don't you tell us what that, about that enchilada? I know what people want to know about it. <laughs> well, um, it's it's just a simple meal because I always, we really like um, Mexican food. So I make a lot of pinto beans and I, I, I usually use a slow cooker. Heather prefers an instant pot, but I've been using a slow cooker forever. So I, I have my slow cooker going almost all the time. I make a big pot of, beans and then I use them for either bean burritos or bean bowls or bean pizzas or whatever I have and then I make two or three meals out of it and, and last night uh, I got a request from um, our son who lives here in Portland um, that they would like to have Tex-Mex lasagna for dinner last night so I I had the beans cooking I figured I'd just make them really simple because their kids are you know how kids are. They want things really easy. So I just took the beans right out of the slow cooker, put them in a big bowl, added some already cooked brown rice, and mixed them all together, and then layered the beans on top of the tortillas with enchilada sauce, and just did several different layers. And uh, it was a huge success. Everybody ate tons of it, and it was so simple. And yeah, you watched me put it together. It took me 
Well, Maybe not, a, not much time. Half an hour. You know, Mary, you're you're that kind of a, of a homemaker in the sense that you don't want to spend a lot of time in the kitchen either. <laughs> no. So uh, the recipes that we have, at least the ones that we follow, are real simple. You know, you, a couple of nights ago, you made a rice dish with uh, some uh, some type of uh, soy condiment. Oh yeah, and yep. that was that was God, that was unbelievably it was good. Just, yeah, just uh, it took you know, about five minutes to put yeah. it together. So in general, we try and teach recipes that are really simple. But you know, once in a while, somebody complains and they say, uh, you know, I like a lot of variety. I, I can't eat just the same thing for breakfast every day and two or three or four different things for lunch and dinner like we do. I need to. I tell them. I said, "Look, we got we got on our own work." Mary's published over four thousand recipes. And if you go to Instagram on our account, you'll find you know, oh, thousands of um, recipes. And it's interesting that the people who participate in the Instagram they, they've they've got the program. I mean, it's not like we have to go back and say, "Oh, you should have left the olive oil out of this one," or you know, we don't have to do that. People get it. And the ones that contribute the recipes, uh, they're, you know, delicious and interesting and some new ideas for Mary and Heather and so on. So there's, there's well, a lot. Know, of some people really enjoy spending a lot of time in the kitchen. I mean, there are some people that are just naturally really, yeah. they really like to cook and they would like to spend hours in the kitchen putting things together. Well, then they, um, they should try the feijoada. <laughs> they should <laughs> which is a brazilian dish that you know has a whole bunch of layers so we have some rather complex recipes too if you want to but you know for, for us it's just a matter of the same thing over and over again we just fix the things we like anyway that's got a little bit off the track there <laughs> <laughs> a little bit no it's important to share food ideas because we need to know what we're supposed to eat right yeah Okay, next question. This is from Stephanie. She also wrote in, she's a 38-year-old female, female, and she has the factor five lead-in blood clotting mutation, and her yep, doctor yep. has recommended lifelong baby aspirin. What do you think about that? I think that's the standard treatment. And, and I would find no reason not to go against the recommendations. This is a, uh, a genetic issue, kind of runs in the family. And and they have an increased risk of blood clotting. And so you don't want that to happen because blood clots are what leads. In fact, they are the cause of strokes and heart attacks. You know, it's almost always a heart attack is due to a blood clot forming. The blood vessel doesn't rupture, you know, to the outside, it ruptures to the inside. So uh, you don't want uh, the blood to be hypercoagulable. Hypercoagulable. <laughs> anyway, you want it to, to be just normal, natural. And, there's an important thing for you to understand is that this research has been, you know, around for 50 years and it's still as true today as it was back then. There's still, still complementary research that is done that shows the exact same thing. And that is that animal fat, you know, from dairy and meat and chicken and so on, animal fat increases uh, the clotting of the blood. It increases clotting factor seven which is the one that is most active when it comes to having heart attacks. Uh, so you, you get the blood all set to, to fall over into a clot when you eat animal fat. Now, vegetable fat does the opposite. Uh, vegetable plat, fat uh, causes the platelets to be non-adhesive, causes the clotting factors to be non-active or not as active. And so it thins the blood and it can thin the blood to the point where you could bleed I, I, I run into patients who tell me that they're taking fish oil alone and fish oil with aspirin. You know, they really want to prevent the heart attack. Anyway, and, and I, you know, I, I, every time they wipe themselves, they bleed. You know, there's something wrong here. Inuit Eskimos who uh, live on a high fish, high you know, omega-3 fat diet, which is the fats that cause the thing in the blood. But they're known, known for fatal nosebleeds. So you need, you got you got the opportunity to, to regulate the coagulation of your blood based upon whether you choose saturated fat or you choose vegetable fat. My, my message to you is don't choose either one. You know, take the natural fat in the foods so that you don't excessively clot, nor do you excessively bleed. 
But if you get the fat from your rice and corn and potatoes and so on, in their natural packages, you won't run into either one of the problems. Uh, you don't want to, you don't want to have your blood too thin. You don't want to get in a situation where, where you get into a minor car accident, you get a brain hemorrhage, which is what you're setting up for by but taking for aspirin. This person who asked the question. Well, they need to be on. They need to be on aspirin. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, the best I know, and the last time I treated somebody with a factor five light and deficiency, which has been a while, I put them on aspirin. And uh, I'd have to do the research again to see whether that's the standard of therapy, but I'm pretty sure it is. But also, in addition to the aspirin, you know, you don't want to get into any blood clotting problems in either direction. So you really should eat a, a healthy diet. Thank you. This next question is from Stacy. She wants to know if anything can be done with done for Meniere's disease. Well, Meniere's is uh, is um, Meniere's is a problem of the inner ear. And uh, I think is Meniere's it, is ringing in the ears. I'm not sure. I was just going to ask, it up. is it vertigo or is it? I, 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 I'm a little confused there whether it's vertigo. It's an inner ear problem, yeah. Meniere's. I know it's an M ear problem. M M yeah. I know it's spelled. But um, yeah, what, what happens is there's one little artery that goes from your carotid uh, right up to the inner ear, just a single artery. And that artery gets plugged. Well, gradually or suddenly with a blood clot rupturing. I've, I've had people who've lost hearing in one ear suddenly because they had a sudden blood clot forming. But uh, you you get hearing loss yeah, right. and you get vertigo. Vertigo. It's vertigo. Okay. Yeah. Many years is vertigo. And you get tinnitus. So I'm, I'm sure it's after, named after a guy named Meniere. <laughs> anyway, um, the guy, this guy named Spencer, all right, he, he did some studies, and you can look them up on hearing loss and diet. Uh, what he did is he, he and his friends decided they were going to go around the world and see if they saw any relationship between populations of people who had heart attacks and strokes and people who had uh, inner ear disease. And so what he found was uh, in countries where they had a high rate of heart attacks, in other words, they ate lots of meat and dairy, they had high rates of uh, inner ear disease. And so it made sense because you closed on this artery that goes to the ear, just like you closed on the artery that goes to the heart when you have a heart attack or the brain when you have a stroke. So anyways, uh, Spencer, he went uh, back to his office after he discovered these things. He got sick himself. He developed Meniere's disease. He developed such bad vertigo, dizziness, that he couldn't get up off the floor. And so he remembered what he had learned in his travels. And he decided to go on a low cholesterol regime, which is the best diet they knew back then. And also whatever cholesterol or medications were available. And he got better. And then what he did is he decided to test the next 300 patients he saw who had high frequency hearing loss. And he put them on a similar regime and he got reversal of high frequency hearing loss in about half the patients. I mean, what I see is people who have uh, vertigo or tinnitus ringing in the ears, when they change their diet, there's a good chance that they're going to get better. There's also a chance they're not. You know, it just depends upon how permanently the damage is and, you know, how bad the particular one artery, it's just one little fellow artery comes up here to the ear. That's it. If so that guy goes, you're in trouble. Uh, anyway, you can look up Spencer's work. Just look up Spencer here, he lost... Uh, high fat diet. You should be able to find it. And if you came to the program, it would be one of my favorite articles that I offer you in a <laughs> section on Kajabi under McDougall's, Dr. McDougall's favorite articles. And so I, you know, I've collected all these articles over the last 50 years, and particularly the ones that are done many years ago, which you must understand articles done many years ago are even more valid than the ones done today. And the we reason to explain that because you get criticized a lot because people say, oh, well, all of his information is ba based on all these old studies and he never looked at any of the new stuff. Well, I've looked at the new studies. I know, but you should explain the well, difference and you know, why. That, when, when the original research was done, they did some really basic understandings, like, for example, with diabetes. 1927, Shirley Sweeney showed that his medical students, when they ate a high sugar diet, were non-diabetic. And when they ate a high fat diet, they all became diabetic. Well, if you repeated that study today, you get the same results. 
They've already done it. Percival Hemsworth, he was the father of diabetes, and he published early in the 1900s. And finally, he put his classic article out in the British Medical Journal in 1940, and where he showed that a high-fat diet in a type 2 diabetic made their blood sugars really high. So the, the, the reason is, is that the basic research was done in the past. They don't have to do it again. It's been repeated, confirmed that this is the truth. I mean, you don't have to, once you figure out the world is round, you don't have to, you don't have to figure out whether it's around by other techniques. Anyway, uh, that's one reason. The other reason is, is before 1980, you could trust the research because you didn't have the meddling of the drug and food companies. But what happened was uh, we had the Reagan economics of deregulation. And they started, the government decided it was going to stop paying for scientific research. Well, you've got all these laboratories around the country and all these people making a living by doing scientific research supported by the government. And all of a sudden, their money was taken away. So that was in the 1980s. And guess where they looked for to get their financing? <laughs> the drug companies and the food companies. So since 1980, I have to be very careful about any research that I look at. And one of the first things I do is I look at the funding. And what you find, and this has been studied, what you find is 70% of the research on drugs is paid for by the drug companies. All the research on semi-glutides, you know, Ozempic, Wegovy, you know, those kind of miracle weight loss drugs. Every single experiment is done by a drug company. There's no independent research out there that you're relying on. So 70% of the research on drugs and an equal amount of research on food is paid for by food companies. I can't trust them. Why? Because, you know, these, these funding businesses, they're not going to hire you a second time if you don't get it right the first time. So they find themselves scientific, you know, scientific groups of people, or research organizations that will go along with their game and, and show what they're looking for. And, and you know, once you know how to rig methodology, you can pretty much show anything you want. So I always look at their methods, second of all. First, their fun funding, and, and then their methods. And by doing those two things, I almost always figure them out. If I don't, then what I do is I go to the letters to the editor. They'll be published over the next several months. And my colleagues, their colleagues, write critiques of their scientific study. And usually they can figure out, they figured out, they know the business. They figured out the trickery. And so once in a while, I have to rely on somebody else to explain to me how, how they're trying to fool the public. But they are. <laughs> That's what they do. These are advertisements, folks. They're not scientific papers. They're advertisements. I used to get confused because the Journal of the American Medical Association would put out issues. Every issue had about 20 full-color advertisements. Must have cost, you know, maybe fifty, dollars $100,000 an ad. And they'd have like, you know, 20 ads at the beginning. And then they would have the scientific research. And then they would have a few more ads at the end. And I used to think to myself, how stupid. Do these, do these drug companies think anybody looks at the pretty pictures? No, that wasn't the problem. I was the one that was making a mistake. The advertisements are in the middle. They are the research papers. What industry discovered is that doctors are... are influenced tremendously by scientific research. So you can get a hold of the science. You can, you can get the doctors to pretty much do anything you want. And that's what they did. You know, it's just business, ladies and gentlemen, it's just business. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, let's see, next question. This is from Jolie. She wrote in and is wondering if diabetic neuropathy can be cured following a whole food plant-based oil-free diet. Well, Sometimes, sometimes, first of all, you should try because there's nothing else that's going to help you. You know, you're not going to get any benefit from any of the therapies that I'm aware of out there. So uh, there's two research papers. One is published by Weimar. That we just talked about Weimar. They did a study on their patients, which are similar to our patients, except they get a big dose of antivenous religion. So they did a study on them where they took, uh, was it 21? Uh, people with diabetic neuropathy. And they put them on the diet. 
No, the diet that we recommend is starch based diet with fruits and vegetables, low fat. And out of the 21 people within four months, 17 of them got better, tremendously better. And in follow up, uh, basically all of them stayed free of their peripheral neuropathy, which is pain and burning and numbness, usually in the feet. The second paper published was by Neil Bernard, uh, PCRM published it. It was in Diabetes Care. And what they did is they, they studied people with diabetic neuropathy and essentially they used our diet. And uh, many of the people were dramatically improved. As I say, what choice do you have? And as everything I tell you is, if it's going to work, if the message Mary and I are Heather are trying to give you, if it's going to work, you're going to see the results of in four months. You know, if it doesn't work in four months and you're really doing what we recommend, then go listen to somebody else. <laughs> the body heals itself that quickly. So, yeah, I, I think you got a darn good chance of helping the, the peripheral neuropathy, even if it's not related to diabetes, which often it's not. And people don't know what the cause is, but it's, you know, it's probably related to the food. You know, pretty much everything's the food, at least in my mind it is. <laughs> it's like a broken record, right? Well, good grief. I mean, food is your strongest contact with your environment. Every day you take in two to four pounds of it. You know, that where, where else would you look first besides what you eat? I know your genes. <laughs> you know, or, or bad luck or the wrath of God, I know. No, it's the food. That you can fix. Well, you always say a little bit of it may be your genes, but that you can't fix, but you can fix the food. So work well, it's, been a, it's been a diversion, Heather, for patients for all the time I've been in practice is uh, whenever the, the pat answer when a doctor doesn't know the cause is it, it's a virus or it's your genes. You know, I mean, how could you disprove it if you said it was a virus or your genes? So it turns out it's the food, it's what people eat. And the evidence is overwhelming. And you can prove it to yourself in, I don't know, a week, certainly 12 days. Just like the people that are in our program at 10 days now. And all I saw was smiles. Every single person I could, I could see their picture. They were thrilled. They got more out of the program than they ever expected. And it should be that way. I, I wouldn't want to run a medical practice that didn't give you what I promised, or even more. And that's the challenge. The challenge is, is you do what we say. You do what we say. You're welcome to come on this show and tell us it worked or didn't work. And you don't have to wait long. Within you know two shows, uh, 12 days, <laughs> you can do it. But you got to really do the program. you got to follow the diet. A starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. No animals and no added oil. Very simple. It's foods that you love. Thank you. Uh, let's see, next question. This is from Super Empathy. They want to know if co coffee causes fibroids. Causes fibroids. Well, there was a big push back in the 80s on how coffee caused fibrocystic breast disease. And everybody was so excited about this idea that uh, somehow uh, coffee stimulated the female breast and you got fibroids, fibrocystic breast disease. But you may be talking about fibroids of the uterus. I've never heard of a connection between coffee and fibroids of the uterus, but the idea that coffee causes fibrocystic breast disease, but pretty much abandoned. It was just, you know, the, the flavor of the moment. You know, people got excited about uh, what causes fibroids of the uterus. The uterine, uterus is made of smooth muscle cells. Uh, muscle cells, okay? And the growth of the uterus is influenced mostly by estrogen, the female hormone, estrogen. If you have an overstimulation of the uterus with estrogen, the cells become overstimulated and they proliferate. And they proliferate into lumps that are called fibroids. They're non-cancerous. They don't turn into cancer. They can get big and they can cause you discomfort or uh, distort your personal appearance. But, you know, the idea that they turn into cancer is just not true. Uh, what you can do about fibroids is you can use a anti-pituitary hormone, 
uh, LRH, I believe it is. But anyway, it doesn't matter if I remember it or not. But there's an injection that blocks the production of estrogen and the fibroids shrink. But it was abandoned as the therapy because as soon as they stopped the medication, the fibroids grew, grew back. And why did they grow back? Because the same stimulus was there. They never changed the patient's diets. So there's a drug out there that works, uh, but it's not used very often. And I would encourage you to use it unless there was some immediate need for you to shrink the fibroid. And uh, they also can go in and do uh, myomectomies where they take just the lump out. That's sometimes done. But there's an important thing you need to understand and know about this is um, fibroids disappear after menopause, almost always. In fact, I, I've asked a few gynecological surgeons if they've ever seen fibroids in women in their late 60s, 70s. And the answer is no. Well, what happened to them? Whereas you see fibroids in women who are premenopausal, still have ovaries that produce estrogen. Or you also see fibroids persist if a woman after menopause <clears throat> takes hormone replacement therapy because you continue to stimulate the, the, the body of the uterus. But um, yeah, they disappear. So if you got fibroids and the doctor says, well, we want to take them out, you say, well, doctor, do, don't they disappear after I go through menopause? Oh, yeah. Well, I think I'll just wait until I go through menopause. I mean, I mean, I've counseled so many women to do that. Just, it's not going to trouble you. It's not, you're very unlikely to bleed from them. You're, you know, turning into cancer is just a mess. Do men never get fibroids? Well, they don't have uteruses. Well, well so oh. the only place that a fibroid grows is either in the uterus or the breast? trying to think about that okay <laughs> I, I don't use I've this never been that I, 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 I have i, I don't know i am trying to think where, where you where you in the testicles and the prostate I, I i've really not heard of fibroids growing in other places except for the breast and the uterus, and the uterus. but then again you know maybe i'm missing yeah, some okay. really obvious thing so <laughs> okay thank you do we need to worry about the arsenic that people talk about being in rice? We're so big on eating rice. Is arsenic a worry? Yeah, you should you should worry about it. You're not supposed to eat arsenic. I mean, there's such a thing as arsenic poisoning, but I've never seen it, okay? I've never seen it. But Consumers Report came out with a report on rice and arsenic about 20 years ago. But what you need to know before I go on with the story is the previous year, Consumers Reports came out with a story about uh, fruit juices that children drink and arsenic. And the levels of arsenic from the fruit juices were higher than what they reported in the rice arsenic article. Okay, so what it turns out is rice is able to accumulate arsenic from the soil. The reason that you have arsenic in the soil is because rice is grown in the United States and Louisiana you know, similar parts of the United States, where they used to grow cotton. And the cotton got infected with boll weevils. And so what they did is they killed the boll weevils with arsenic. So the arsenic got in the soil. And now whatever you plant on that soil is going to pick up the arsenic. In this case, they just happened to look at the rice. It, it, there, there are certain what we call hyper accumulators. And one of the most efficient accumulators in the vegetable kingdom are cruciferous vegetables, you know, like, like cabbage and spinach and broccoli and cruciferous vegetables. They just suck up the poisonous thallium and cesium and you know, all kinds of stuff from the soil. They're really, really efficient at it. Anyway, getting back to the rice, uh, you just... Be careful where you buy the rice from. Uh, we have uh, enough evidence to say that the rice grown in California is clean. At least, you know, some of the manufacturers, some of the producers. Uh, if you buy rice from Asia, you don't have this problem. But if you buy rice that's grown in previous cotton fields, then you're going to get the arsenic. And as I say, I've never seen arsenic poisoning. 
but I've seen a lot of disease due to rice deficiency. So the idea that you should avoid rice, I think is doing far more harm you know, than any accomplishment when it comes to arsenic poisoning. But we never heard anything about the arsenic and the juices. No, but you know, they did. Oh yeah, I know, but nobody ever reported on that. Well, they did. It was in consumer's report. It just didn't yeah, have national attention. No. And and yeah, I, I well, you know, Mary, I have to come back to you know, people like to hear good news about their bad habits. So anything that they can find that will justify their gluttony, they're going to do. So they don't like rice. You know, they don't want to hear that you're eating a lot of rice to cure heart disease and prevent prostate and breast cancer. I mean, it just doesn't fit with what they see on their dinner plate. So when anything comes up like this, like B12 deficiency or, you know, the idea that uh, the vegetables are whatever, are, you know, contaminated with, with one chemical or another, what else the stories they tell about vegetables? I don't know. But anyways, it just fits in with what people like to hear, to defend their own eating habits. I can give you some positive sides. Every time an article comes out about red wine, that gets a lot of attention or chocolate. Yeah. You know, I, I remember a front page article in the San Francisco Chronicle. The whole page was about how healthy chocolate was. That that had to be the that had to be the biggest selling edition of the San Francisco Chronicle ever. People like to hear good news about their bad habits. So not many people eat fruit juice, but a lot of people eat rice. <laughs> and, and chocolate. And chocolate. <laughs> Thank anyway, you. it's you know just just try try and shop around, you know ask the question what Lumberg rice you buy. Lumberg is from the yeah. rice that we buy. Yeah, and rice from Asia is going to be okay. Or any organic rice, right? Well, you'd hope, Heather. Uh, you, you know, I don't know what organic means, uh, <laughs> unless there's some kind of definition for organic. And, you know, if it is included, well, the thing is, is that that the uh, arsenic is in the soil already, so it wouldn't be something that they sprayed on it. Yeah, right. So it might, they might be able to say it's organic, and yeah, we didn't put any pesticides on top. But about a hundred years ago, they used to grow cotton here, <laughs> and now there's a whole bunch of arsenic in the soil. That could be a way. But people eat a lot of rice, and they're being threatened by eating rice because of what we say, and many other people are saying. And we point out just healthy the Asians are, were, were, not are, <laughs> well, until they gave up rice. Before 1980, 90% of the food in China was white rice. Before 1980, there was essentially no obesity, no type 2 diabetes. You know, prostate and breast cancer were extremely rare. Another rice eating country I know the data from uh, is Japan. Post-World War II, there were like 73 cases of prostate cancer in the year following World War II in Japan. Now it's, you know, an epidemic among the Japanese, uh, the breast cancer. And when I talked to a group of Japanese women who had breast cancer in Japan, they told me that their mothers had never heard of it. You know, it was, they never taught, they never taught, discussed it. But grandma never heard of breast cancer. Well, you know, things have changed. The American way is all over the world now. Okay, next question. This is from Kathleen. She would like to know what your thoughts are about eating raw and juicing instead of eating cooked food. Well, <laughs> juicing, when you juice something, what you do is you hit it a thousand times with a steel blade. You don't make fruits or vegetables healthier by disrupting everything in them. What happens when you eat disrupted fruits and vegetables is the body responds differently. But first of all, I've got to qualify, but it ain't a big deal for most of us because good grief, the body's strong. So don't let this discourage you from eating fruits and vegetables, but you juices, fruits and vegetable juices, if you like them, but they're not better than the fruit or vegetable. For example, uh, in a uh, work by a guy named Heaton that was published in about 1978. What he, what he did is he took subjects and he put a, a needle in their arm so they could take blood from them at frequent intervals. And what he did is he measured the insulin in the blood and the blood sugar. He fed these people, he fed them whole apples to start out with. And he looked at the blood sugar and it went up a little bit, and then it went down a little bit, and the insulin levels went up just a tiny bit. 
Then he took the apple with the stems, peels, seeds, everything, threw it in a blender and made applesauce out of it. And what he found is the blood sugar went up uh, about the same as with the whole apple, but it went down dramatically and the insulin levels went up much higher. And then he took and separated the pulp from the applesauce and he made apple juice and the blood sugar went up, but it went dramatic drop, hypoglycemic. And the insulin levels went way high. So that, that's what happens when you damage the food. But again, like I say, you know, you can put up with, you know, you know T-bone steaks and <laughs> gallons of ice cream. And you, know, you have an amazing body that you live in. A little juice ain't going to hurt it unless, unless you're dealing with problems like hypoglycemia or uh, high triglycerides. You damage the food and the triglycerides go higher. Um, so, you know. But you have to also answer the rest of the question, What's which right? is a raw diet. Oh, right. Okay. That's a whole other subject. <laughs> You know, they're, they're, I mean, how can you eat a raw starch-based diet? Raw brown rice, not going to work. Raw beans, no, don't think you're going to do that one. How about raw potatoes? Well, maybe. I, I hear people can eat raw potatoes. How about raw sweet potatoes? Never heard of people eating raw sweet potatoes. The human diet is a cooked food diet. All right. Uh, Richard Rangham. Rangham? Rangham. Yeah. He's from... Uh, I think Dartmouth, we had him as a guest speaker. He wrote a book called Catching Fire. And he explained that a million years ago, the uh, primate harnessed fire, which gave us an opportunity to cook the food. When food is cooked, it releases more energy, more calories, it's more digestible. And so it was the, uh, the, the ability to cook the food to get enough sugar, okay? That's what fuels the brain, is sugar for the development of the brain that the human being has. We have a brain three times the size of a chimpanzee. So cooked food uh, was required for us to make the transition from a lesser primate to homo sapien. And uh, so much of the, the, the diet is difficult to eat, if not impossible, except when you get into some green and yellow vegetables and some fruits, of course. But this is a starch-based diet. You're gonna have a tough time. Uh, people who raw follow, follow raw food diets. Well, let me tell you, no, I don't know what I should tell you this, but let me tell you about the algorithm, about my experience with raw food diets. We, we got to this place in, uh, was it Tiburon, California? With a, um, I think it was Larkspur. But Larkspur, it was you remember the name of it? Roxanne's. Roxanne's, okay. I couldn't afford to go there, but uh, one of our participants decided to reward Mary and I by a trip to Roxanne's for raw food and uh, ended up costing $500 for four of us. So it was a very expensive place. Well, Roxanne served uh, a raw, was it lasagna that I got? Yeah, it was a lasagna. Okay, you and you got something else and yeah. the other people got something else. But anyway, they brought them out on regular sized plates with this tiny little bit of food. And it had to be a tiny little bit of food otherwise because it was made of nuts and ground nuts and. You know, maybe some soy and what else would be raw? Oh, well, they use cashews. Yeah. And so I, everything it was so high in calories. Yeah. If you did anything more than put a little tiny, it was about the size of four, four postage stamps. That somebody would say, well, you know, every one of your meals is like 800 calories. If you gave the size of food that I, that I eat on a plate. So anyways, we had this meal and my host asked me how I enjoyed dinner. <laughs> I said, well, that's barely enough food to get me to Taco Bell. I guess everybody laughed. You know, nobody, but, you know, nobody quite gets your sense of humor. I'm not. sorry to tell you. <laughs> anyway, you know, it, uh, the human diet is a cooked food diet. All right. If you want to lose more weight, then raw food will help you because it's less digestible. But you're certainly not going to miss anything in terms of nutrients or health promotion. By eating cooked food, it does not destroy the food, the, the nutrients. Uh, I mean, if it does to any extent at all, it's not not enough to cause any deficiency ever. It's a cooked food diet. Thank you for explaining that. Okay, next question. This is from lifelong learner. Question about fish oil. They've been told that they need to take it for severe dry eyes, and in this I, case, even then, don't you don't recommend it. Correct? I don't. I don't think that works. To treat dry eyes with fish oil. 
They're, they're talking about putting it in the mouth, not in the eyes, right? I think so. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've heard that too. Again, you know, I, I would have to ask whoever was recommending fish oil to provide me with a randomized control trial. Should be simple to do. You know, take one group of people with dry, you know, take a big group of people with dry eyes, divide them into two groups. You have the control group, which doesn't use the fish oil, and the intervention group that does, and see what happens. You know, show me the studies. You know, anecdotal experiences are too often, you know, based on people's, uh, you know, uh, Unfortunately, there aren't really enough um, controlled studies well, for, well, you for know, all the stuff that you hear. But Mary, the amount of money that fish oil salesmen make. Oh, I know. Good grief. This is a billion dollar business. And and uh, some of your health food gurus out there, they, they make millions of dollars a year. Uh, fish oil is supposed to help everything. Yeah, I mean, not healthy. just dry eyes. It's supposed to help with everything. Doesn't help the fish. <laughs> I know it doesn't and this help is a real fish. serious problem is we're depleting the oceans. And one of the reasons we're depleting the oceans is because of the popularity of fish oil. You know, 90% of the fish are gone. From the time I was a young boy, 90% of the sea life is gone. So you better be darn sure that fish or fish oil is doing you an awful lot of good because, you know, the oceans are important. Anyway, I, I don't, I don't, but first of all, I don't believe it until somebody shows me the evidence. And uh, second of all, even if it were true, even if it were true, I'd certainly look for another way to treat your dry eyes. Like there are solutions you can put in your eyes to help them dry. But let me tell you the cause of dry eyes. Most commonly, the cause is an autoimmune disease called sojourn syndrome. And what happens is the body attacks the lacrimal glands, you get dry eyes, and the salivary glands, you can't, you don't have much spit. It's an autoimmune disease where the body attacks these glands. I believe that this disease is caused by eating foreign glands. All right. So you eat pig and cow salivary glands and lacrimal glands. Now, how do you eat pig and cow <laughs> salivary glands and lacrimal glands? Hot dogs, sausages. They waste nothing, Pepperoni. nothing in slow. Pepperoni. So you end up eating these foreign these, things, yeah. these foreign glands, and the body looks at them and says, "This is foreign. I must make an antibody against it." Well, in the in looking for that antibody, it finds similar tissues in your own lacrimal, lacrimal and salivary glands, and it attacks those and it kills them. It's called sojourn syndrome, and uh, it's not reversible. But there's another reason for you to change your diet is to stop the development of autoimmune diseases, which are so common. In fact, I'd have to go so far as to say pretty much everybody on the Western diet has some low level of inflammation being caused by the foods that they eat. And it's aches and pains and, you know, burning muscles and things like that. You know, just generalized mild complaints, which is pretty standard for the American person. European person, Australian person, whoever eats the Western diet, they're sick. They complain all the time. Well, this is a low level of inflammation to cause that kind of complaint. When it gets real serious, the body really gets, gets uh, efficient at looking for, uh, for various glands. It, it kills the glands, like your thyroid gland. The, the reason you have hypothyroidism, your doctor will tell you this, is due to autoimmune thyroiditis. And again, where do you eat foreign thyroid glands? Well, they don't waste, waste anything in a, in a slaughterhouse. You know, you end up eating kidneys. You end up attacking your kidneys. You end up eating cow's milk, and that has a whole bunch. Cow's milk has a whole bunch of proteins that the body reacts to, which, you know, affects the kidneys, affects the joints, affects the pancreas. Yeah. Anyway, that's what I would do with dry eyes. Thank you. I remember the question. <laughs> okay, next question. This is from Claudia. She wrote in, she used to be a junkie vegan suffering from chronic headaches and migraines. Three years ago, she switched to a starch-based diet. The headaches and migraines disappeared. 
However, she was diagnosed with hyperkalemia, which is elevated potassium. Can yeah. you comment on that? Hyperkalemia, boy, that that would be really unusual to occur through diet alone. Now, even taking in potassium salts, you know, the no salt type stuff, which is potassium chloride. I don't know that you could get into trouble with elevated potassium by even doing that, unless you ate a box full, which one of my patients did once. <laughs> uh, usually the cause of hyperkalemia is one of two things. The one is you have your kidneys failing and the potassium goes up. Uh, you have to lose about 90% of your kidney function. In other words, you only got 10% left before the body can't handle the potassium in the diet. So that's the most common reason. And, and hyperkalemia can become fatal when the potassium level gets over seven. So you do want to take it seriously. But the other reason that the potassium can be read as high is they ruptured the blood cells when they took the blood out of your arm. So the first thing I start with, unless you have kidney failure, first thing I would do is repeat the blood test, see what's going on. I don't, I can't think of any other reason somebody would have an elevated potassium hyperkalemia than what I talked to you about. But, you know, and again, there probably are some other reasons. <laughs> Thank you. Next question from Leslie Ann. She's wondering if elevated B12 could be a problem. Well, I don't think so. Uh, it, it, but most people on the American diet have an elevated B12 level. It's called the luxus vitamin. It's vitamin A and B12 are luxus vitamins. In other words, we have such high levels in people who eat the American diet because of the animal foods that, uh, anyway, far, far more vitamin B12 in your body than you'll ever need. So I don't know of any adverse effects to having high levels of B12, but unless you're taking vitamin D B12 pills, that's an easy way to get it, or you're still on the meat. You know, the, of course, animal foods, have, particularly meat, has uh, high levels of B12. So low levels of B12 are almost unknown. Almost unknown. There may be a few cases out there, but even in vegans, you know, it's extremely rare to have a disease due to B12 deficiency. You can have metabolic changes, you know, if, uh, urine changes and blood changes depending on B12. But these are things that happen with, within a, a normal, healthy person's life. It, it's not a disease. Actual B12 deficiency to diseases, I don't know, maybe there have been six or eight or 10 cases reported in the scientific literature. I can find no more than that. And I, I would argue that even those eight or nine or 10 cases are uh, actually due to something else. But, you know, I don't want anybody to become B12 deficient. And so you know that our standard recommendation, since I don't want anybody to become <laughs> B12 deficient, is we've been recommending for the last almost half a century that if you're on our diet for more than three years, it takes about 20 to 30 years to run out of B12. But if you're on the program for more than three years, or if you're pregnant or nursing a baby, you should add a non-animal source of B12 to your diet. And the doses is uh, five micrograms a day. You need 0.5 micrograms to reverse pernicious anemia. I give you 10 times as much. When you go to the store, you'll find pills that have 100 times as much or 1,000 times as much B12. And I can't go into the explanation of why they do that, but they do it. <laughs> they just do it. So try and get a supplement with as low a dose as possible and take the B12. Once a week, once a month, every day. Our recommendations have been five micrograms of B12. If you've been on the diet for more than three years, or if you're pregnant or nursing, it covers everybody. Okay, it's six o'clock. We ran out of time. Right. Thanks, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. Well, I can't let you go, Heather, until you tell us when the next program is, because this one is such a big success. I know we're taking some time off because I'm being given an award by a physician group on September 10th. Where, where's that award at? Desert Hot Springs. Desert Hot Springs, yeah. It's called the Plantrician Society has given me an award for my work for a lifetime. Anyway, so we're taking a little bit of time off there and we're busy giving a five lecture series, uh, which is, uh, a brand new series. Uh, that starts at the next week. It starts next yes, Saturday. Saturday. 
Next Saturday. And uh, so our next program, uh, I know we're really busy in the next couple of months. So you had to delay starting another program. When's it going to run the next one? October 14th. And we're taking signups now. And this last one sold out. So you want to get signed up if you're thinking about it. Yeah, you don't. It, we, we fill up. And, you know, that's that's a good sign, isn't it? So I'm waiting for the day when we need to double the number of programs we run, <laughs> and we will in time. I mean, this five o'clock broadcast has more than doubled in its attendance since we started. You folks, you're telling your friends and relatives, at least listen to John and Mary McDougal. You know, come and spend a little time with them, get to know them. They're not doing anything that's going to be harmful to you. And it may be the answer to your problem. Give it a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Tell everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. See you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific.